Hello and good afternoon and welcome to our Lunch and Learn today. This is an educational program on how to advocate for your business and build trust in bioscience with state lawmakers. So we're very happy to have with us today. Um, oh, let me introduce myself. I'm Renee Miller. I'm the program manager at the Oregon Bioscience Incubator. And we really appreciate that all of you are here today. Okay, so I'd like to introduce our speakers today. We have three speakers. Ken Gordon has been the executive director of NWABR since 2014. And prior to his role there, Ken was the executive director of the Potlatch Fund for five years and Trust Waikato for 10 years. Ken is also an adjunct faculty member of Seattle University where he teaches board governance. Matt Marquis is our second speaker. He's grown up in a life of politics and has worked with Marquis and Associates since 1997. Matt is head lobbyist and president of the company. He's had great relationships with both legislators and people within the executive and judicial branches. And during the legislative session, you will find Matt at the Capitol meeting with legislators, agency heads, and testifying daily. Jody Hack is our third speaker, and she's the Senior Regional Director for Pharma and a former member of the Oregon State House of Representatives, where she served two terms. While in the legislature, Jody served on the House Business and Labor Committee and Healthcare Committee, and now she advocates for bioscience and researchers. So I'm going to enable the chat and Okay, looks like it's ready to go. So if you have any questions of the speakers while they're presenting today, please put your questions in the chat and we'll do Q&A at the end. So Ken, are you ready to go? I am, I'm just gonna okay. share my screen. Sounds good. And if everybody wouldn't mind, please keeping their microphones turned off during the presentation, we would appreciate it. Thanks. <clears throat> So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ken Gordon, and I'm the executive director of the Northwest Association for Biomedical Research. And if you hear a funny accent, that's because I'm originally from New Zealand. I've lived in the States for 15 years now, but um, I still have this wee bit of an ac accent. So I'm going to be talking about public trust in biomedical research. And I think um, having public trust is key to any kind of advocacy roles that you might have in the future. And historically, public trust levels in biomedical research are at low levels. Um, and I think this comes about because of a whole series of things like culture wars, um, anti-science activists, uh, conspiracy theorists. Um, but I'm going to also make the point from this presentation that um, we have also done it in biomedical research. We've done a terrible job at building public trust. And the thing I worry about when we lose public trust is that the commensurate thing that happens is that we, we then get burdensome legislation which can impact our ability to drive new developments in biomedical research. And so um, what I am proposing and what we as an organization at the NWABR do is we propose that the way to build trust is to be more transparent, to be more open, and to start telling our own stories. So the Northwest Association for Biomedical Research has been around now for um, over 30 years. And what we do is we run a whole series of, of uh, conferences for organizations in the Northwest, which includes Oregon and Washington, um, around uh, uh, science communications, uh, clinical trials, human subjects protections, animal research, and biosafety. Our basic thinking is that if the research community does that work well, then we can take that work and message it to the public. And so we can share with the public what's happening in biomedical research. But the thing that we need to be very aware of as we think about biomedical research is that, click the right button, is that we're actually working against a headwind of a loss of public trust in all of our institutions, not just biomedical research, but across the country. And I'm sharing um, now a slide from an organization called the Edelman Consulting Group, and they do an annual survey of trust in 28 different countries. And I'm sharing with you the slide, the, um, their survey results from the 2017 and 2018 years. And I'm sharing those years in particular because I want to make a point about the trust levels. 
In 2017, the United States was right here in the gray zone. This is the what I call the Goldilocks zone. You know, not too hot, not too cold, with a trust level of 52. Um, and in 2018, Edelman saw the single biggest one-year drop in trust that they'd ever recorded in their survey, with the United States dropping nine points down to 43. Sorry, yeah, 43. Um, so what happened? What happened to drive that? loss of trust. So this survey um, uh, asked people for their trust in government, for their trust in the media, uh, their trust in for-profit organizations, and their trust in non-profit organizations. And what happened between 2017 and 2018 is we had a new president elected in the United States. Um, and from day one of his administration, there was an argument about what the really nature of truth was. And the president was claiming that the media were mainstream and are telling lies. And the media was passing every statement he made and fact checking it all. And essentially, we had two major parts of our economy at war with each other. And what we saw was this commensurate nine point loss of trust. And as we think about trust in biomedical research, we have to realize that there is a, just a loss of trust across the board. And we see that in other areas. Uh, this is a, a slide that was put together by my uh, colleague, Max Brown, at the Desimony Consulting Group. And this looked at um, the, the Pew Research Poll here, looked at um, in May last year and September last year, whether people would be get the vaccine once it was passed and it was safe. And in May, you know, the vast majority of us were going to get the vaccine. Um, and in September, that dropped down by 20 points 20, um, by to 51%. And so what went on? Well, firstly, the um, anti-vaxxers anti got on board. Um, the conspiracy theorists got on board saying that the Bill Gates had put nanobots into the vaccines in some way. The anti-science people were on board saying the COVID isn't really a real disease and the vaccines aren't going to work. Um, so we saw this huge drop in trust in the vaccine process. And of most concern to me, 42% um, of people in a similar um, poll that Axios put out at the same time said they did not trust the FDA. And until this last year, FDA has been the gold standard in administering, our, administering the um, release of new drugs, new devices, new procedures. And people trusted that if the FDA said it was okay, that it would be oh, good. And we saw this huge number that said that they no longer trusted the FDA. We see some similar trends um, in driving more into biomedical research itself. This is a long running survey series that's put out by Gallup. And they basically ask, do people believe that it's morally acceptable to test on animals? And I sort of take this as our proxy measure as to whether, uh, test, uh, whether biomedical research is trusted. And the interesting thing about this series by Gallup is if you look at older people, you know, 35 and older for this series, the trust levels have stayed pretty static over this whole you know, like decade plus. But what we're seeing is that from the 18 to 34 year old age group in this series, so these are millennials, um, that those trust levels have fallen dramatically you know, by, by nearly uh, 33%. Um, and what's going on? Well, what we know is that millennials in particular want to see a lot of openness and a lot of transparency. And unfortunately for us in biomedical research, our default mechanism is to not share information about what we're doing. And I think that's what's driving this, this poll. Now, unfortunately, Gallup hasn't released um, this age breakdown since 2013, but they still, re re they still do produce the headline numbers. And so this is the headline numbers. The blue line at the top basically is the people who believe that medical testing is okay. And you can see that it's going down. So, Okay, and in my terms, this is the trust in our work is going down. The orange line at the bottom is the people who don't trust us. And what you can see is that those lines are going to converge. And in fact, absent 2020, they will have converged in the, in, uh, by about 2023. And what we know from the other so-called moral things that Gallup has polled over the years is that when those lines converged on the issue of interracial marriage, those states that had laws that banned interracial marriage had those laws changed. When those laws crossed on gay marriage, and gay marriage became legal right across the United States, those lines are crossing on the issue of, medical, of, of, of marijuana law reform at the moment, 
And I think the vast majority of states in the United States now have some kind of legalized recreational or medical marijuana. And what, I, what I'm concerned about in my role as an, as an as a ED of an advocacy organization is that when those lines cross in our field, um, then there's gonna be burdensome legislation put in place in terms of the use of animals in research, the use of human trials, clinical research, and it's gonna become fairly impossible for us to have new drugs and new developments coming to our world. And I think one of the reasons those lines are crossing for us is that we have been guilty of letting people tell our stories for us. And particularly you know, if, I, if I'm just focusing on, on the use of animals in research, um, the people who work in biomedical research aren't talking about what they do with animals and research, They're not talking about the very careful processes they use to make sure that animals are treated humanely, that they do everything possible to minimize pain and suffering. Um, but that we don't talk about how animals contribute towards um, human trials. Um, and so essentially we've got other people telling our stories for us and that's what's driving those numbers. However, if I go back to my, my prior slide, um, we have seen this, this, this thing here, and this is an uptick in the trust for our research. And so what's different? What's different in 2020 that's driven this? For the first time ever in my seven years at NWABR, we've started talking publicly, uh, publicly about research. Um, we've talked about phased human trials, We've talked about the animal trials that have been used for treatments for the coronavirus and COVID-19. We've talked about animal trials in relation to the development of a vaccine for the COVID virus. And so, so for the first time ever, we've been talking as, an, as, a, as a collective biomedical research community about our work. And the result is that we're seeing a change. We're seeing a change here. And, and it's, that's, this is against a huge trend against a huge trend in trust. And I think this is my hope for the future. And so what we are recommending to everyone is that we have to get out of, our, out of our comfort zone and we have to start talking a lot more about our work. And this is a, um, a screenshot of me talking on Fox, um, trying to respond to some of the anti-vaxxers and anti-science advocates that were pushing back against our, um, uh, the development of the vaccines for the coronavirus. And so the things that I want to leave you to take away from this Lunch and Learn series is that to build trust, these are the things we need to do. We need to be more transparent, we need to be more open, and we need to start telling our own stories. And so for transparency, we have to be truthful, we have to be complete when we give answers. We can't be giving us those, those kinds of answers that use you know, like Weasley words which aren't quite the truth. And we have to share the nuance about the complexity of the work that we're doing. In terms of openness, we have to start actively sharing the work that we're doing and we have to use multiple channels. You know, uh, publishing a publication in a peer reviewed journal is great, but that's not getting to the public. So we have to use devices like you know, social media and all the other channels to actually get those stories out. And we have to tell our own stories. We have to get away from this idea of anti-science activists telling stories for us. And when we tell our stories, we have to leave with the why. Why do we do this work? Why is it important? Why would the public care about the nature of this work? And we have to show the journal journey. Biomedical research is complicated, it's expensive, it takes time. And so we have to share the story from the basic science, through the animal models, the human trials, to this new product that we have now for people to develop. Because I go looking for those stories and they're just not there. Um, and we had to take the position which I refer to as being the humble expert. Humble, we have to be sincere, honest, we have to acknowledge what we don't know, but we also have to own our own authority because we do know a lot about this work. And even a dummy like me can go on Fox and do, a, I think, an okay interview, it tries to you know, um, intervene with some of that vaccine hesitancy that was going on. And the most important part of this process is that we have to repeat it. You know, there's tens of thousands of stories out there about how bad research is. And so we need to we need to balance that with hundreds of thousands of stories about why research is important and why the work that you all do is important. And if we have those three things going on, transparency, openness, and lots and lots and lots of our own stories, then we can start to rebuild the public trust in the work that we do. 
So it's a great pleasure um, being with you for this lunchtime. I will be available for questions at the end of the other presenters. And so I'm gonna hand back to Renee. Thank you, Renee. Thank you very much, Ken. That was really, really interesting to see the trends um, over time. Um, someone did ask about a link to the Fox interview. So if you're able to find that and pop it into the chat, that would be awesome. I'll do that. And up next, we have Matt Marquis. Matt, if you're ready, you may go ahead and take it away. Thank you. And thank you for the opportunity to speak to all of you today. Uh, I'm going to spend a little bit of time just talking about our legislature in general, um, how the process of a bill becoming a law or not a law uh, works, and some of the ways um, to just build trust within the legislature, I think. Um, but currently, uh, if you're not aware, Oregon is very much a, a democratically controlled state. Currently in our Senate, we have 18 Democrats, 12 Republicans. In the House, we have 37 Democrats, 23 Republicans, and a uh, Democratic governor as well. Uh, certainly, we have what is called a supermajority uh, of Democrats in both the House and the Senate, meaning even on issues like taxes, uh, they have the ability to pass those with a three-fifths vote without um, needing the other party to partake in those. Um, for a bill to become a law, and some of this you guys may all know, but I'm just gonna go through some of these basics uh, regardless and, uh, and see how it works, particularly when it comes to uh, pieces of legislation that are of interest to you. But everything has to pass both the House and the Senate in the exact same form. Um, most of the time with just a simple majority, 16 in the Senate, 31 in the House, and then it needs the governor's signature. For me, myself, I live and die by those numbers. Uh, so what I do is count. And you know, I know that I need 16 or I need 31 votes or to kill something, I need 15 people to say no or 30 people to say no in the House. Um, because we have such a democratically controlled state at this point, uh, the Re Republicans really do try hard to work with some of those moderate Democrats and trying to kill kind of the just anti general business types of legislation. Um, however, in Oregon, they, we also have a part of our constitution that says a quorum in Oregon is actually two thirds of the members need to be present. Uh, so one thing that the Republicans have taken to as a strategy is to leave the building and to not show up knowing that no work can be done and to use that as a negotiating tool and trying to slow, stop, or kill certain types of legislation. This is not a new thing. Certainly when the Republicans back in the 90s um, were in control, uh, the Democrats tried this very same thing. So it's not a new new thing. It's just done a little differently today uh, through the Republicans. Leadership in Oregon is uh, leadership in, in our legislature. Um, the president of the Senate, Speaker of the House are two of the probably most powerful people in the body. Um, we have a very strong committee process in Oregon. So as bills are introduced, they go to a committee. So if you take the House, for instance, the Speaker of the House not only determines what bill goes to what committee, but she also determines who is the chair of that committee and what the exact makeup is of every committee. So just knowing and having that ability certainly controls what can pass and what can't pass um, almost just with, you know, the strike of a pin as far as what bill goes to what committee. Certainly, you know, a health care bill is supposed to go to the health care committee, but oftentimes it could end up in a rules committee or somewhere else, just depending on um, what happens during a given legislative session. A perfect example of that could be uh, a bill that we see this session dealing with patents, particularly in the pharmaceutical world. Uh, that bill is in healthcare, but you know, have it had it have gone to a judiciary committee, it certainly would get a different take on things as just the makeup of those committees are uh, incredibly different. Uh, same thing in the president, uh, with the president of the Senate and the Senate, he you know dictates what bills go to what committees, who serves on those committees and who is the chair. And really they serve at his will and can be changed at, uh, at any given time. Um, this session, there, there's a lot of pharmaceutical legislation. Just a, a few examples of that has to do with price controls, as I mentioned, patents, and also how pharmaceuticals are sold through their representatives and, and those types of things. Educating legislators is, um, is, is super important and building relationships with, with individuals is important. And how, how you go about doing that, I think, is, is important throughout the interim and, and building those relationships, describing what your business does, how the legislature can affect your business during the interim is always better to do uh, than coming to somebody during the legislative process and 
for the first time introducing yourselves. But the more you can do during the interim, the better, even though you don't know what may or may not be coming as far as legislative policy issues, certainly they will trust you much more as you have a relationship with them asking about specific legislation and those sorts of things. Um, my job oftentimes is not necessarily to speak to a legislator myself, but to find out who the best person is. And it, it's funny, uh, oftentimes uh, it's a spouse or somebody like that, um, but oftentimes it can be somebody else. I have other clients in the um, cosmetology realm and almost everybody sees their, you know, somebody to cut their hair once a month or once every two months. And they have a lot of, un, uh, they just have a lot of attention of that individual at, at that time. And so oftentimes somebody like that can be the right person. It just all depends on the given scenario at a given time. Um, the one thing I would tell you as you think about advocating on behalf of your industry or your, your business, um, the time of uh, hearings are important, uh, but, but oftentimes things are well decided well before a hearing or well before a vote actually takes place. So your ability to build those relationships during the interim and be able to meet with committee members and just general members of the Senate or the House before a committee and to be able to explain one-on-one -on -one what situations may affect you and how they may affect you and by describing your business and how your business works uh giving them a better understanding of why you know a price control might uh hurt innovation or those types of things um certainly goes a long way before you ever get in front of a committee to testify uh certainly in today's virtual world in particular it's very difficult to get across um your message during a virtual hearing and given you know two to three minutes to speak uh virtually not in person questions aren't really asked anymore and those types of things the more individualized time you can get all of the better it will go to serve you um i would just say that uh, in in oregon this year uh certainly there's nobody allowed in the building uh it is a virtual world from my perspective i've gone from you know talking to 15 to 20 legislators a day to sometimes, you know, four or five legislators a day and having more and more advocates as our legislature is, you know, really a, a part time uh, legislature there. This is not their only job. They rely on, you know, their ability to learn from advocates because they don't have really professional staff with the exception of a few places. Um, and their only way to learn about issues is through people grassroots advocating for their business and those types of things. Um, and so from my perspective, now that I am limited, uh, having that individual perception of businesses being able to meet with legislators and get some of the time that I frankly have a harder time getting in this world um, goes a long way in trying to advocate for different types of industries throughout the pharmaceutical realm. Um, We'll wait and see what happens this legislative session. Certainly, there's a lot of things that could be good and bad in the pharmaceutical world. Um, most of those won't be decided until probably late in this process uh, as we go through the end of June. In April, if you aren't aware, uh, April 13th is a huge deadline uh, cut off for legislative uh, bills to come out of the first policy committee. So everything, uh, any House bill that's in House health care, for instance, has to get out of that committee by April 13th. And then the middle of, of May is the second uh, deadline. So a House bill, if it makes it out of House health care, gets across the House floor and then goes to the Senate, needs to be out of that committee by the middle of May. This year, um, things are a lot slower in moving through the process. It's going to be interesting to see how that second um, deadline comes up against a lot of particular pieces of legislation, particularly now that we've had a couple of, um, unfortunately, a couple of legislators who have tested positive for COVID um, and not being able to have floor sessions and those sorts of things is really going to create this huge backlog. And it will be interesting to see how that second deadline really affects different types of legislation. Um, with that, I think I'll wait, pause, happy to answer questions when it's my time, and I'll try to keep you guys on track. Thank you, Matt. That, that was really interesting. You know, we hear a lot about, um, there's been a, a lot of focus on federal Congress. So it's interesting to hear what is going on in Oregon and what's happening this legislative session in particular. So thank you very much. And Jody, I see you've got your camera on. Are you ready to go? Sure. Okay, go right on ahead. All right. 
thanks, Renee, and thanks to all of you for tuning in today. Thanks for the opportunity to be here. As Renee stated earlier, um, I did serve, sorry, there's things popping up on my screen. Um, I served two terms in the Oregon House, and as well, I was a lobbyist for about two years. So I bring kind of a different perspective to the table, having been on both sides of that. <clears throat> Over my time in the legislature, I can tell you I served on multiple committees. Uh, healthcare, business and labor, rules, education, environment and natural resources, resources transportation, uh, and several others. And the reason I bring that up is to show you, give you an example of the diversity of issues uh, that a legislator has to be pretty well versed in. They can't be expected to be an expert, but uh, there is just an array of things that come at you. Part of your job when you're serving on a committee is to take legislation that's brought forth in your committee and you take that back to your other members. We call that our caucus. Um, and everyone gets together sometimes once a day, depending on where we're at in the session, uh, sometimes a little bit less. But you get together and you talk about legislation that's happening in each committee. So you take what you know about those pieces of legislation and you basically inform all of your members what's happening in your committee because it's tough to be everywhere and to know every piece that comes through. Um, as, as Matt said, it starts, um, I can tell you legislation starts from a need. Uh, it starts from an, an idea, a perspective, an experience that someone has. Um, and from there, the process begins. Uh, I'll tell you that state legislators pass a lot of legislation. Unlike federal, they may be there for 10 years before they're able to pass a piece of their own legislation. Uh, on the state level, your ability is, is pretty much unlimited. Um, at the end of a session, the legislature, it's not unlikely for them to have over a thousand bills go through the system and pass and be adopted into law. For example, this year alone, uh, even in a virtual setting, legislators uh, have introduced over 4,000 bills. So there is just a plethora of information that comes in and goes out. One of the things I wanna stress on, and I think both of the other speakers uh, did as well, is it's critical when you introduce legislation or adopt law that you have the perspective of all sides. A good legislator doesn't take an idea and just put forth a piece of legislation without first saying, who's gonna love it, who's gonna hate it, and why? And also looking at what are the future ramifications around passing a piece of legislation? What are the tentacles that may be far reaching that you don't know? Um, and again, you cannot be an expert in all things. So we count on people like you to provide valuable and firsthand experiences and information. Your voice honestly may be um, half of the story and without it, it's not heard. Um, so the more proactive you can be, the better. Uh, as some of the other speakers said too, you know, it, it's critical for you to build trust with a legislator. And oftentimes uh, you do that during the interim when they're not actually in the legislature, in, in the session, excuse me. And so reaching out and building those relationships, finding out who in your, where do you live? Who is your legislator? Um, I can tell you having been on the lobby side and being a legislator, when, a lobbyist comes up to testify or calls and meets with you. It, it's important, it's critical, but when it's your constituent, those are the people that put you in those seats. Those are the people that you are responsible to and you answer to. So finding out who your legislator is, your senator, your representative, reaching out, introducing yourself. You may not even have an issue that's happening at the time, but it's just important for you to reach out and begin to build those relationships and to gain that trust. Um, as Matt said, the process starts uh, in one chamber, chamber and moves to another. During the session, you will have multiple opportunities to reach out to folks uh, and to be heard. But again, it does go back to a lot of it is about relationships and who you can and can't trust. The lobbyists uh, give us a, a broad stroke and a good perspective and you've got lobbyists that you respect and you count on. But again, it is different to talk to someone who has firsthand experience and can not only give you perspective that no one else has, but also delivers that in a way that is relatable and transparent and um, forthcoming. So I would just you know, express again to you the importance of reaching out and building relationships. I can tell you in my time serving and having been on the healthcare committee, 
I was inundated with pharmaceutical manufacturers and um, may decline this call, excuse me. And uh, health insurers and PBMs and CCOs. I don't think I ever had a visit from, from a biopharmaceutical um, industry, the business on the business side. So I'll just close with this. And I know I'm probably going a little bit short. I think you've heard a lot today and you've heard, um, I think a lot of different perspectives. So I don't wanna continue to belabor it, but what I'll close with is firsthand experience. I can tell you honestly, if you're not there to tell your industry story, somebody else is gonna tell it for you. And it more than likely will not be an accurate story. So if you don't want someone to tell your story, then it's critically important that you engage on every level that you can. And today's a first start. So from today, take this and decide that at least you're gonna find out who your legislators are. Uh, what, we're just, where your, if you have a business, is my business located in Senator Betsy Johnson's district? Is my, do I live in Senator Betsy Johnson's? Do I live in Peter Courtney's? Um, find out where those connections are. Go look on the legislative website. Find out who those committee members are and send them an email. I want to introduce myself. If you ever have an issue that comes up around biopharmaceuticals and you want a perspective of mine, please feel free to reach out. Here's my contact information. They have the staff that works for the legislators takes all that information and they, they keep it. Again, continue to reach out though, because it is better to be proactive. But anyway, in closing, um, just tell your story before somebody else does. So appreciate all that you do very much and the work that, that you do. Um, really appreciate it. Thanks, thanks for letting me talk today. Thank you, Jody. That was really interesting hearing more about the process of getting bills introduced and passed and how uh, business owners can get involved in some steps to take. First, find out who represents you. Start there. Thank you so much. So we are taking questions in the chat. And if all the presenters want to open their um, cameras and microphones, we have a question early on from for Ken. And the question is, um, do you think that our country is less able to deal with the nuances associated with science? And Brie, if you want to open up your microphone and add to that, you are welcome to do so. So I think um, the simple answer to the question is yes and no. Um, I think that we have been um, terrible at communicating science. So people haven't had access to the nuance. And so they've been getting these black and white things. And, um, and Einstein said that anything that involves more than four processes, people think of as magic. And so I think we've been guilty of people thinking that um, when they get sick, they'll go to the doctors and there'll be some kind of magical cure for them. And this got driven home to me. You know, and I work in this field. I work with animals and research all of the time. My father-in-law had lymphoma, had this really nasty lymphoma and lots of treatment. And we basically thought that his, um, his specialist was essentially uh, creating, curating a treatment just for him. Um, and that was, that was what she was doing. And I came back and I was talking to someone about that and they said, no, that was all developed at Fruit Hutch locally here in Seattle and it was developed using dog models. And so, and so here, here's this example where I'm in the business, I should have known that, that, that physicians aren't allowed just to practice on their patients. There's a whole history of all hundreds and hundreds, thousands of hours and, and decades of research from, from Fruit Hutch that went into that. And what we're guilty of is that we don't let people know that when we have this new drug, this new development, this new process, that it's been built on all of this past research. And that's where we're guilty. And I think, again, that's not, I'm not gonna put the blame on the public not knowing the nuance, I put the blame on us not sharing the nuance with the public. Good. Good point. Um, thank you. And also Ken did put into the chat the link to his Fox interview that was on the one slide. So if you click on that link, you'll be able to view that interview. Um, we had a comment from Bruce Coleman from the city of Sherwood thanking you for the presentation and your work in encouraging a business friendly approach to state legislation. We've got, um, oh, 
uh, Karen Berg put a link in the chat to find your legislature, like your legislator. So there is a link right there that you can click on to see who represents you. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Uh, Dave Farrell is asking, how can scientists participate in outreach to the public? I don't even know where to start. So who wants to take that, that one? Um, I can try. Um, okay. So Dave, you can call me. Um, we actually have a program called Research Ambassadors where people who work in science, um, we will give training to, um, we run an annual conference for those folks. So you get more comfortable at presenting your stories uh, about what you do for science. Um, and then we are getting requests all the time. It's, it's died at the moment with COVID um, for public presentations. Um, but once things start to reopen, we know those requests are gonna start coming. And so we link up people we've trained to be good communicators with people who want to make those requests. The other thing you can do is use your own personal social media. And, and like a lot of organizations are really nervous about their folks using social media to talk about their work, but just start using your social media as a platform to maybe share other science innovations. Um, um, Ramsey Cox, who's on this link here somewhere on this, um, helped us you know, getting a lot of um, anti-vax and, and, and COVID research out to the public and people gobble that up and um, and we went from having like a couple of hundred likes on our social media pages a month to having like 145,000 likes in a month when Ramsey was helping us and so we know that the public is really wanting to have this information and and just by sharing stories you can do that. Great thank you. Matt do you have anything to add to that where where a scientist can begin to start? Yeah well, certainly just um, figuring out who your legislator is, um, is goes a long ways. And that was a great link that somebody posted in, in the chat. That was a great idea. Um, and starting with that and, you know, maybe not during the legislative session, uh, sometimes it's a lot harder to get in, but building a relationship with that legislator during the interim, um, whether it's just, you know, calling them up, having a cup of coffee with them, having a phone call conversation with them, a Zoom meeting like this, whatever the case may be, depending on the given state of the world at the time. But um, getting to know them then is super important. And I'm going to guess that as a scientist, like Jody mentioned earlier, finding out who your uh, lobbyist is, if you per se, uh, I would be willing to bet if you are a member of any sort of organization, that organization has a lobbyist. Um, and they can certainly help you get in contact with the right individuals at the right time as well. Thank you. Jody. do you have anything to add? The only thing I would add is, you know, once you find out who your legislator is and you do some research on who's serving on what committee, don't be afraid to branch out besides just who yours is, but definitely make that a priority. You can also check on their websites. They hold town halls. Sometimes they do telephone town halls. Sometimes they're virtual, sometimes they're in person. Um, and you can go and just kind of learn a little bit more before you even approach them on a cold call. If you want to go and see what they're about, shake their hand, say hello, introduce yourself, not having to even have a huge conversation, but it just opens the door and starts um, communication in a way for you to kind of get to know who they are. Great, great. And Doug Kawahara added that scientists really need to learn to speak plain English to the public. Yes. And that some universities are adding communication programs to their um, to, to their degrees and training because um, if the people that you're talking to don't understand what you're saying, then the message isn't getting through. Very good point. Joshua Bowman asks, how can I change policy of the use of Roundup? I can, I can chime in there. That is a huge uphill climb, I can tell you, after serving on environment and natural resources. Um, again, it starts with building relationships, and it starts with going to the legislator and saying, I have a problem, and here's what I, here's what I see, and here's what my solution is. Um, I, I wouldn't want to put any false sense out there that uh, that, wouldn't be, that that would be easy, um, but you know what? Anything can happen. The only thing I would just real quick, the only thing I would add to that is somebody that also represents the chemical world. Um, <laughs> that issue is super uh, complicated. It's just people's perception uh, around chemicals and things like that and, and, and cause and effect are um, 
are so different on each of those sides that uh, perception though in those individuals is reality. And so trying to change people's perception is difficult um, and good science isn't always uh, what people want to hear about. But the more you can build relationships and the more people trust you, certainly uh, your views, whichever side you're on on that issue can certainly uh, help sway those perceptions. Great, thank you. David is asking, uh, he says, I'm aware of one bill in pharmaceutical pricing that's now in progress. What is the process regarding patents and other pharmaceutical issues? Are, Matt, do you, are, are you wanting us to give a perspective on those specific bills? David, do you wanna open up your microphone and um, elaborate on your question? No, my, my question is just at, at kind of a high level, what are the main bills that um, pertain to the pharmaceutical industry? Because I'm only aware of the one pricing bill. Right now, I wasn't aware that there was anything in, pl in play regarding patents or any other pharmaceutical issues. Yeah. Um, I'm going to, Matt's probably got them in front of him so I can let him cover all of them, but I can just tell you um, having the Northwest as my region and hearing what's going on across the country, Oregon has the most outrageous, crazy, progressive, awful pharmaceutical bills, um, ranging from patent settlements to setting prices, to sales rep registration, to transparency, confidential information. Um, it, it's ridiculous. But Matt, you probably have all those. I'm in my car. So I'll have Matt just run through the list really quick. Um, and if you need additional information, like our positions and things like that, um, I can work through Jessica to help share those as well. Yeah. So just real quick, um, certainly there are several, uh, and I, you know, some of them are more pointed directly uh, at the business and some are more on the outskirts, if you will. But uh, House Bill 2044 uh, is in a, uh, is an attempt to expand on the current transparency laws that are housed over at Department of Consumer Business Services today by um, starting to just uh, add more features as far as what manufacturers uh, need to disclose to DCBS. Uh, on the patent stuff, Senate Bill 764 uh, is that patent Senate bill that Jody uh, just referenced. Senate Bill 763 uh, is a requirement to license pharmaceutical representatives. Um, and my apologies, DCBS is Department of Consumer Business Services. Um, so uh, that is the regulatory body that uh, oversees that transparency program. Back to Senate Bill 763, uh, again, licensure of pharmaceutical representatives and how uh, they interact and are what actions they're allowed to do in interacting with, um, with doctors and other folks. Um, there was a bill to... Um, create a take back program for sharps which is now no longer alive in this process but you know accompanied with that is a um a producer responsibility type of legislation found in senate bill 582 uh that would uh, create a a product stewardship if you will for all packaging uh and right now certainly includes all pharmaceutical products as well whether that's over the counter or prescription drugs um, and then uh, there are there's a handful of other bills. One, you know, kind of positive bill that's still out there and moving forward is Senate Bill 560, which really uh, helps consumers um, combat uh, insurance companies on how coupons are dealt with. Um, and um, the bill, as drafted, would require that you know if somebody comes in with a coupon from a manufacturer, that those go towards their out-of-pocket expenses uh, within their insurance policy and those sorts of things. There's a there's a handful of others, but I think those are probably the main ones right now that so, are actively being worked on. I don't think you mentioned 844, Matt, which is Senate Bill 844 um, establishes a prescription drug affordability board, setting upper payment limits. Um, on manufacturers. The interesting thing in that is they left the docs in um, and we had some of our cancer docs uh, come in and testify against that on, you know, cutting innovation and also um, not, you know, stepping on the toes of, of them being able to prescribe medications that they need for their patients. The interesting thing on that is they um, allowed the insurance companies and the PBMs the, um, to opt out of that bill. So they're basically not in it. 
so I would say that is the most egregious, worst bill for our industry uh, in the country. Yeah, and again, I'm sorry I didn't include that. Oh. I just, that was the one okay. bill that I thought he knew about. So that was the one I left off the list. <laughs> Yeah, thank PBM you. is pharmacy benefit manager. Looks like somebody answered that one. Okay. Great, great, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Bree asked a question. What do you think of the impact of telehealth, which has sped up from the pandemic? What do you think the impact will have on our industry? Oh, if I can jump in there for a second. Okay. Um, so I think telehealth has actually been good for biomedical research. Um, and in particular, it has actually helped us to um, democratized trials. Um, before we had the majority of our appointments for telehealth, if you wanted to participate in the trial, you used to have to hop in your car and sometimes drive several hundred miles to a major hospital where you could you know, be a part of that trial. And now with telehealth, um, with some um, new flexibility the FDA has given us for the running of trials, um, you can often do that same participation at home. You can have the pharmaceuticals delivered to your home. Uh, you can have, um, we can watch you virtually as you administer the drugs or the devices or whatever. Um, and so that's actually opened up and I think improved that aspect of our research uh, one of the things that we're worrying about is that as the pandemic winds down, the FDA might tighten up on their ability to have virtual visits for biomedical research. So I think for, for that aspect, it's actually been a good thing. Yeah, sounds like a great thing for this community um, to be able to expand their clinical trials. Um, let's see, what else do we have here? Um, Oregon Bioscience Association did um, chime in about um, Senate Bill 844, um, that its intent is to lower out-of-pocket cost to patients. Um, it's in the chat. You can read what they wrote there. We've got, um, we don't have any other questions at the moment. So while I'm waiting for a couple more, I'm going to put up a poll. If people would please fill out the poll questions. There's just three of them and it's anonymous, but we use this information to help improve our programming. And I'll leave that up there for a minute or so. So thank you for filling that out. And we have another question from Misty. She says, we've been fortunate in having an active patient community that's eager to learn and meet with legislators. Our perception has been that it was better to allow our patient organizations to contact the representatives. Would you recommend us helping facilitate that or even attending with them? Jody, Sorry, I just lost connection for a second. Can you oh, repeat that? Yeah, absolutely. Misty from one of our um, OBI companies, Circumvent, she is asking, we've been fortunate in having an active patient community that's eager to learn and meet with legislators. Our perception has been that it was better to allow the patient organizations to contact the representatives. Would you recommend us helping facilitate that or even attending with them? I would say both. So yes, help facilitate that if you can get them engaged. I think that's equally as important. But then, but again, that's telling part of the story. And I think it's even, you know, it's equally as important for you all to tell your story. So I would say doing both would be ideal, but I also understand sometimes it's difficult to be able to engage. Virtually, it's been a little bit easier, but um, it can be difficult. So to have those patient advocates, especially those that are located in specific districts are key. Um, to working with legislators, but I would say a combination of both would be, if I could pick it, um, that's what I would say, because each are going to bring a different perspective, and the business perspective may be far different than the patient's perspective. While there might be some overlap, um, I would say if you can do both, that'd be even better. Great, thank you. David is asking if there's anything on the docket about enhancing funding to um, organizations like ours, Otrati, and other signature resource centers. Matt, I don't know if you want to chime in on that. I Not that I am aware of. Um, I have to be honest, I served on healthcare, the healthcare committee um, for a few years, and I didn't really realize what Otrati was um, until I now work for pharma. So I, I think you're not, a, you're may not be on the radar as much as you potentially could be. Um, Matt, what's 
you know, I think there, this is an opportune time for you, given what's happened with COVID and all of the innovation and the research that came about with that. Um, I would think, you know, strike while the iron's hot. But Matt, do you want to chime in? I have not heard of anything. Yeah, I have not either. I, I'm not aware of anything currently um, as far as uh, funding and those sorts of things uh, for this session, at least. I'm not aware of anything. Okay, great. Thanks. Uh, Doug adds that I don't believe the public understands what impacts their out-of-pocket costs for drugs. How would you go about go about making that clear? What their out-of-pocket costs would be. Well, I'll just jump just, in because I think that's a complicated insurance topic. Mm -hmm. um, but we often get criticized that drugs are too expensive. And one of the reasons that they're expensive is that the drugs that you're buying today have paid for all the research for drugs, which for one reason or other, haven't been able to come to the human markets. And so there's a huge cost of those drugs that have been researched and for one reason or other have been found to be not safe or effective. And some of those, those drugs will fall, fall at the last hurdle. So you know, there might be several billion dollars invested into them. And for one reason or other, it's not, deemed safe to bring them to into human use and I think again that's part of our messaging is that we have to talk about how complex this world is and if this work is and particularly for new drugs new drugs for existing convict, uh, conditions um, it's such a hard task for us to be able to prove that this is going to be a demonstrably better result with less side effects than the existing standard of care and it's it's complicated. And so we need to bring people into that mix of, of things that affect um, the use of drugs. And we, we've just not done a good job of that. You know? And it's partly because we don't tell our unsuccess stories. But I think those unsuccess stories are actually a huge part of our benefit. You know, the reason that thalidomide didn't you know, devastate a generation here in the United States is the FDA didn't allow that drug to come in because enough, not enough research was done. Whereas in New Zealand, they did. And so I grew up with babies who were thalidomide victims. And so we don't talk about the things, the near misses that we stop because drugs aren't brought to the market. So I'll, I'll just chime in really quick. Um, one of the things I would add is, is it's, it's that piece for sure. And pharma has some really good materials on how many drugs are um, in innovation and never make it percentages and things like that, which is astronomical and the billions of dollars that it costs to do that. I think the other piece is um, basically it's following the dollar and pharma's also got some really great, done some really great research and has some information we can share with you. But from the time it starts to the time it hits the consumer, you'd be shocked um, at all of the pieces of the pie that come out of that. So part of that is like Matt referenced that um, Senate Bill 560 is making coupons count. So the discounts that um, are provided to consumers aren't passed on to consumers. They're kept by insurance companies and PBMs. The same with rebates. So um, we had another bill, SB 439, that um, passed all of the rebates, which is billions of dollars a year, that's not, that aren't going to consumers, but instead going into the pockets of the insurance companies and the PBMs. So I'm happy to share those. Um, there's some really easy quick visuals that you can use that just simply says, follow where the money goes and you'll see all the different pockets. Um, but I too am frustrated in that. I don't think that we've done a good job in our industry to share our story. Um, I, I think telling the story about how much is invested, it doesn't even have to be a monetary figure. It needs to be, this is how many, this is how many times we try things. This is how many, this is how many stabs at the apple we might take before we ever hit something. I don't think people have, I know they don't, they have no idea what it takes to get from start to finish A to Z. Um, but it's articulating that in a way that's easy for people to understand and we don't lose them on the scientific side. So, um, but we can provide some really great, easy to read and, and um, share handouts. Yeah, that would be great if you could share them with me and then I can forward them to the attendees today. Um, our last question is, uh, we've got Joshua Bowman, it lives in Hawaii, and he wants to affect some policy in Texas. What is the best way to go about trying to make, help make changes in another state? Matt? Yeah, I was gonna say, Matt, do you wanna take that? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, 
you know, not having, uh, you know, not having all of the knowledge of exactly how the legislature in Texas works, but some, um, certainly there's going to be the same types of organizations and advocacy groups in Texas as there are in Oregon or Washington or California. Most of those organizations um, are pretty much in all 50 states. And whether you're tied closely to one group or another, um, if you have that base in your home state and being able to reach out to another state's chapter of that same group oftentimes can um, point you in the right direction and the best way to get in touch with the key members of that legislature or the committee members or those types of things um, to start that process and make some introductions for you. Um, it's, you can also just simply, you know, do cold calls and, and start, you know, get on the line and look at who is the chair of whatever committee uh, is in is hearing the particular bill that you're interested in and, and looking at those committee members and emailing them, calling them and those sorts of things. Um, but sometimes often, or oftentimes I should say, the best effect you can have sometimes is working through those local chapters of different advocacy groups that you're already involved in. Good, great, great idea. Thank you. And thank you to everyone. Um, Thank you to Pharma for sponsoring this event. And thank you to Ken Gordon and Matt Marquis and Jody Hack for presenting today and to all of you for attending. This um, meeting has been recorded and we'll be posting a link to the recording so that you all can see it and also be sending out Ken's slides that were shown at the beginning of the meeting. So we'll be sending those out to you and any visuals that Pharma that you have that you would like me to send out with those. So uh, attendees, please look for those in your mail sometime tomorrow. And with that, I think we're going to close up today. I really appreciate you, appreciate your support of the OBI and attending our events. And we will look forward to seeing you next time. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.